Welcome to Unit 6 of Philosophy and Film, which is about personal identity. Now, this is a popular topic in philosophy, uh, a topic that has been much explored and um, has seen some exciting developments in the last, oh, I don't know, 30 years or so. Actually, longer than that now, given how old I'm getting, um, which is still in philosophical terms, very recent. Uh, so this unit is driven by the philosophy primarily, uh, and the, the films are sort of more illustrations of it than in, say, the film noir or the comedy section. Uh, consequently, the um, readings are uh, readings that you might come across in a wider diversity of philosophical classes, like, uh, for example, the first reading, this one, by Stephen Stitch and Donaldson, um, is from an introductory textbook, Intro to Philosophy, that might be used in a 101 class. Uh, the other two articles are by major philosophers in the field. Uh, this one is by Eric Olson. Um, who propounds a theory called animalism, although he doesn't call it that. And this is a fairly early article, and he doesn't call it that there. Um, and then this one, which is by Derek Parfit, who is widely regarded as one of the most important and influential philosophers in Anglo-American philosophy of the past quarter century. He died just a couple of years ago, but as you will see if you reach the end of the article, that won't have bothered him much, <laughs> given his views on identity. Um, so those are the readings, and those are what I'm going to talk about. All right, so first of all, um, to talk about personal identity, we must first discuss identity. Now, identity is a relation uh, that can hold. Now, the difference between it and other relations, like, for example, greater than, that's a relationship that holds between two different numbers. So, for example, three is greater than two. Whereas identity, which you might represent with the equal sign, uh, doesn't seem to involve um, two different things. It seems to hold between a thing and itself. Um, so, what I should what I hope that that is making clear is that uh, what we're talking about in when when we talk about identity in this context is what um, both Parfit and Stitch and Donaldson refer to as numerical identity, being one and the same as. This is to be distinguished from qualitative identity, uh, which is what you are talking about when you say, for example, identical twins. Identical twins of course, are not even qualitatively identical because, uh, well, for example, I knew a pair of those when I was an undergraduate. And actually, I didn't know I knew a pair of them uh, because only one of them went to my college until his twin visited him and I said hi to him across the table and then I looked across the table from him and I saw him again and it was like a, you know, I was doing a double take. Um, but the way you could tell them apart is, fortunately, they had bad acne. So they had different patterns of acne on their face. But they did send uh, send out a birthday invitation once that had two little speech bubbles. One said, it's my birthday. And the other one said, no, it's my birthday. Anyway, identical twins are, uh, let's assume that they were absolutely identical. Um, that would still be what is called qualitative identity. They would appear they would have they would be identical they would all have all the same properties the same skin color eye color you know relationship uh, distance between the eyes whatever but they would not be numerically identical once they were numerically identical because uh, the history of uh, identical twins is that they come from the same egg uh, same fertilized egg which then splits there was something in the news recently about a semi-identical twins, which is fantastically rare. So Google that and see what that is. Um, but 
Yeah, identical twins come from the same fertilized egg, uh, compared with fraternal twins, for example, where there are two different fertilized eggs that just happen to uh, both, um, you know, implant in the womb at the same time. Whereas identical twins started from one uh, fertilized egg. So at that point, there was just one thing. But as soon as it splits into two, there are two things. They are not numerically identical. They are, uh, even if they're qualitatively identical, they're not numerically identical. Okay, so that's a bit of terminology out of the way. All right, so identity is an interesting philosophical property. And you can ask of various things, what does it take to preserve identity? And this is a question discussed by the great uh, English philosopher John Locke, who is a contemporary of Isaac Newton's. Um, and Locke is probably more famous or should be more famous in the United States for his political work. Uh, for example, he wrote a very short, um, certainly compared with its, uh, its influence, a very short work called Second Treatise on Government, um, which laid basically the groundwork for what was the US Constitution. That was basically cribbed from John Locke's uh, political philosophy. So enormously influential there, but his giant tome, um, the essay on human understanding, uh, has been very influential in non-political areas. And no, no more, uh, it has been, no other part of it has been perhaps as influential as his discussion of personal identity. As you saw, uh, they quote, um, Stitch and Donaldson quote the contemporary philosopher Sidney Shoemaker. Slightly confusingly, there's another philosopher who writes on the same topic uh, called David Shoemaker, but they're unrelated, and Sidney did it first. Sidney Shoemaker, who uh, predates Parfit and has uh, set some of the table for Derek Parfit, uh, describes the sort of history of uh, the discussion of personal identity as footnotes from Locke. This was a reference to a quote from Alfred North Whitehead, who was a contemporary of Bertrand Russell, who talked about the history of Western philosophy as being footnotes to Plato. Um, you know, so therefore showing how enormously important and influential Plato was. Well, Shoemaker wanted to make the same claim about Locke in the sphere of the discussion of personal identity. And it's certainly true. He did um, uh, set the table for much of what has followed. So, and the way Locke approaches it is he first of all talks about identity of other things, like for example, identity of a lump of, say, Play-Doh. Suppose I show you a lump of Play-Doh, then I put it down, and then I show you another lump of Play-Doh. You might ask, is that the same lump of Play-Doh? Because you don't know what I did when it was out of sight. What would have to be true for it to be the same lump of Play-Doh? Uh, and what Locke says, it has to be made of the same basic uh, particles. Remember, this is around the time of Newton, so they're just starting to, atomism is taking off again. So what he would say is it has to be made of the same atoms. Now, that's pretty strict standards. So if I take off even a tiny, tiny invisible fraction of a few Play-Doh atoms, it's there at the uh, bottom of the periodic table, Play-Doh. Um, if I take off a few Play-Doh atoms, it's no longer the same lump. Um, but Locke says that's the standard for lumps of stuff. They have to be, to be the same, they have to be made of the same stuff. Now, is that stand of standard of identity has to be made of the same stuff? Does that apply to everything? Does that apply to our use of the same in every other context? And very quickly, it becomes clear that it does not. Uh, and another thing he goes on to discuss is vegetables. Not, you might think, a very exciting philosophical topic, the identity of vegetables. But what he means is all plant life. So he says, uh, suppose I get a sapling uh, and then I leave it in the care of my friend and go off on a trip around the world and when I come back it's a it's a tree. Is it the same plant? Now obviously it's not made of the same stuff. 
not only has it got a lot more atoms, it might not have the original atoms because living things shed uh, cells and um, take in new material. You know, that's what that's what ingestion is. You're taking in new material, you're making new cells. So it doesn't have to be made of the same stuff. Now, uh, if you remember earlier in the class, I introduced a distinction between necessary and sufficient, which I will always repeat is a very important distinction. Remember, something is necessary for something else. If the first, if you cannot have the second thing without the first thing, you got to have it. So that's a necessary condition. Then the sufficient condition is this is sufficient for this if having this guarantees this. So, for example, being a whale uh, is sufficient for being a mammal because if you are a whale, that guarantees that you're a mammal. Conversely, being a mammal is necessary for being a whale because you can't be a whale without being a mammal. All right, so that's necessary and sufficient. Now, uh, does being made is being made of the same stuff necessary for being the same plant? No, you can be made of new stuff and still be the same plant because of the process that happens with plants. Uh, is it sufficient? Well, um, that would seem to be the case, except if you bring up the issue of a dead plant. Um, because actually what Locke decides is the criterion of identity for plants is sharing the same life. So in other words, um, you know, as often happens, if you leave your plant in the care of uh, your neighbor or friend, it will die. What do they do? They can just say, ah, eh, your plant died, sorry. Or they can try to cover this up by getting a new plant very similar to it and say, here's your plant, isn't it great, it survived. Now, what would make it true that it was the same plant? Um, what he says is if the life that was somehow animating the sapling that I left in the care of my friend is the same life that now animates this tree. Obviously, that's not the case if my plant died and he replaced it. It's not part of the same life stream. Now, Locke himself doesn't really explore this notion of what what is a life. What, what do you mean by a, the same life? He doesn't really get into that. Um, but what he does say is he says, uh, this is also true. This is true not just for plants. This is true for animals as well. So in other words, what makes uh, the dog the same animal as the puppy is that it has the same life. What was making the, this this uh, barking chunk of puppy atoms uh, alive is the same thing as what is making this, um, you know, large fluffy dog thing alive. Um, okay, what about persons? Now, what is meant by persons? Because it is used by uh, philosophers in a slightly, it's actually used uh, it comes up in two different contexts in philosophy. One context is in the moral sphere. Uh, so, for example, we are we say persons are moral. Per, per, personhood is a moral notion. If you have personhood, you are a moral person, which means uh, usually, if you believe in rights, that uh, you have a certain set of rights. So, persons have the rights to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, those kinds of things. Uh, and actually that comes from Locke. Uh, life, liberty and, the, and property were his three. They changed the last one to uh, pursuit of happiness in the Bill of Rights. Um, so moral personhood is this concept. And, and so we say, for example, rocks are obviously not persons. Adult humans obviously are, but there are some problem cases are, for example, people in persistent vegetative states? Are they persons? Would it be murder to unplug them? What about fetuses? Is it is abortion murder? If they are moral persons, then it seems like it is. Uh, if they are not persons, then it isn't. Okay, so that's a moral personhood. Now, that is not totally unrelated, but you can separate it from the question of uh, personhood through time. So, what Locke meant by person I've forgotten the exact word, wording, but basically a conscious being. Okay, so a person is something that 
is self-aware essentially if you are self-aware now you can obviously relate this to the moral personhood because you might say being able to be self-aware is a morally significant quality and the fact that for example uh, bugs we assume are not self-aware means that it's not murder to squish a bug um, but and for example some uh, pro-choice uh, writers have argued fetuses are not self-aware so therefore it is not murder to kill them once a human develops self-awareness at some point in its uh, development maybe even after birth uh, maybe even a few months after birth um, then it becomes a person uh, then you get into issues of well then is it okay to kill babies because they're not yet persons we don't want to get into that here um, except tangentially it, it sort of comes up in the uh, article you know uh, was I a fetus by Olson all right so a person and now uh, as Locke says person is uh, an important notion and it's important notion for legal purposes as well as moral well moral and legal so for example suppose uh, somebody committed a crime I care about the person that committed that crime um, I don't necessarily although they usually overlap care about the particular creature animal or human or whatever that committed that crime now if this seems confusing um, this is where we get into an awful lot of the rather outlandish what it, what philosophers like to call rather pretentiously thought experiments and there are a ton of them in this topic now I happen to love thought experiments there are some people who hate them some people who disapprove of them uh, if you don't enjoy them to a certain extent you won't like them and also you won't like most of the movies uh, that are in this section because they're doing thought experiments um, particularly the ones written by Charlie Kaufman uh, like um, uh, being John Malkovich and eternal sunshine of the spotless mind which I think are great uh, and I hope you do too if you've already seen them though you have to watch some of the others remember that um, all right so Locke says a person is something that's self-conscious now what makes his uh, his writing so influential and radical is he says that's not necessarily the same thing as a human being now obviously we could say having seen movies like E.T. you can say obviously being a human being is not necessary for being a person because if a human being is a self-conscious entity E.T. is clearly self-conscious and he's not human so it's not to be a person it's not necessary to be human uh, but and we could also say that being human is not sufficient because uh, someone who is brain dead say they've had a massive uh, brain bleed as they call them in their frontal cortex and destroyed the cortex's capacity for consciousness well they can be alive they some of them don't even need um, life support they just need uh, a drip they don't even need to uh, a respirator because it's the brain stem that is responsible for keeping your body alive you can breathe you can do all these things without um, being capable of consciousness that part of your brain is dead and it's not coming back but you're still alive your body is certainly alive you're breathing you will make facial expressions another rather tragic case of this is anencephalic babies some babies are born without a cortex that part of the brain is missing you know that their heads often just end about here and then it's just skin across the top that's uh, a rare birth defect uh, and it's even rarer that they are brought to term because usually this is visible on an ultrasound and if this happens uh, the mother will abort it because this is a child that is won't live long there was a famous case uh, baby K I think it was who was kept alive because the mother insisted and I think that lasted like two years but that's at the outside with in incredible care but they will never they will never have any conscious thought they're less conscious than a mouse uh, maybe less conscious than a cockroach or a worm um, 
they can't feel pain, they can't feel pleasure. All of that stuff is done by the cortex, which is missing in anencephalic children. So, but they're clearly human and they're clearly alive. So being a living human is not sufficient for being a person and it's not necessary. And this is something that Locke pointed out. So Locke says, uh, makes a distinction between the human and the person. Now I, Locke would say, am both those things. I can talk of myself as the person, as the animal. And I can say as an animal, you know, I am, I can describe my physical features. I'm this tall, uh, you know, I was conceived at, you know, so-and-so time. I, I, I don't know where I was conceived and frankly, I don't want to know. Um, and maybe my parents don't know, but uh, they probably don't remember at this point. Um, but I can talk in those terms. I can say, I began as a human entity, a human animal, so and so time ago, uh, and then I was born nine months later. As a person, though, I would have to say that I came into existence a good deal later. A good deal, you know. Uh, I came into existence when I first became capable of not only first became capable of consciousness, but first being uh, was capable of making memories. Okay, because uh, Locke says that the criterion of persistence through time of a human of a person has to do with memory. All right, before we get to that, though, Locke uh, first eliminates other candidates. So uh, in Locke, Locke sort of considers there are two major candidates for what makes me the same person now as I was in the past. So imagine this, you find a picture of yourself that your parents um, took of you when you were very little, maybe a baby. Look at that baby and say to yourself, well, that's me, but why is it me? Because for all you know, they just took a picture, you know, when you buy pictures in the frame in the store, they put, you know, dummy pictures in there. Maybe that's what this picture was and they're just they're just shitting you. You know, they they never bothered to take a picture of you as a baby. You asked, what did I look like as a baby? And I said, oh, better give it better give them something. And they gave you this fake picture. What would have to be true for that baby really to be you and not just some baby chosen randomly? What's the connection? So the two theories before Locke were the body theory and the soul theory. Okay, the body theory says that um, it's that body that the baby uh, is made of grew into this. Now, what do we mean though? If we mean body in the same uh, in the sense of a chunk of Play-Doh, that would be false. That uh, if it, even if it's a photo of the baby that turned into you, it's not made of the same cells. Famously, we shed uh, our cells and regrow them every seven or eight years. Um, apparently, there are some cells that remain the same throughout your life, but most of your body, like uh, here's another famous statistic, something like 80% of household dust is human skin cells. Pretty gross, uh, because you're always shedding cells. So you're not made of the same stuff. So if we had the, the same stat criterion of identity for bodies as we do for Play-Doh, then that wouldn't be you. Okay, so that's obviously not the sense in which it's the same body. Well, what about the life idea that we've already talked about? Uh, that, that baby is the same as this one if the life that animates that baby is the same one as that animates this one. Um, that would work and essentially uh, Locke would agree that it's the same animal. But where he would disagree is he would say, if uh, remember, he says you have an, you're basically an animal and a person. But what he says takes priority. If you had to choose which one is more important, it's the person. That's what you're referring to when you say I. You're really referring to the person and not the animal. Okay. Um, so this is where Locke comes up with the very first uh, of many, 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 many thought experiments in this topic. And this is the Prince and the Cobbler. And you, this is described in Stitch and Donaldson. 
So he says, imagine Prince and a cobbler in, in a small town go to sleep one night, and then when they wake up, the person looking the looking out of the prince's eyes has all the memories and experiences of the cobbler. It's as if the cobbler goes to sleep as a cobbler, opens his eyes, and he's in the palace, and he looks down, and he's, he looks like the prince, and vice versa. You know, the, the prince closes his eyes, then wakes up and opens his eyes in a hovel and is, is horrified. Um, you know, it's like Freaky Friday. Same, same idea. Um, if that happened, we have to make a decision. What happened to the prince? The body theory would say the prince still exists. It's just that he now thinks he's the cobbler. Because the prince is the, the prince's body. The, the animal that grew from the child prince. Uh, and if you subscribe to the body theory, you would have to say that. You would have to say, the prince exists, he's still in the palace, it's just something weird happened to him and now he thinks he's the cobbler. What Locke says, and I found most people agree, is that no, everybody says, or you know, the vast majority of people who when presented with this say, no, the prince is the one who now has the cobbler's body. And what that demonstrates, according to Locke, is that having the same body is not sufficient to be the same person. Because the person in the palace has the prince's body, but isn't the prince. It's the cobbler now. Okay, so that's what that example is supposed to show. So that's supposed to debunk the body theory, because the body theory says being the same person means having the same body. And this example is supposed to show that isn't true. All right, what, what's the other major theory of personal identity before Locke comes along? The answer is the soul theory. This dates back at least to Plato. Plato, uh, those of you who've taken uh, ancient philosophy classes know in works like the Phaedo and the Mino, uh, he talks about the immortal soul. And he has this theory that the immortal soul exists before the body uh, it is exposed to the information from the forms and so on. This idea was incredibly influential and in fact is uh, most people, most historians of ideas think this is where the Christian idea of the soul originated from, from Plato. Um, so the soul, well another famous, uh, another philosopher who sort of worked on this idea is Descartes and Descartes famous, Descartes, René Descartes who it came shortly before Locke, um, uh, the first of the, the early modern philosophers. René Descartes, also famous for inventing coordinates that are called Cartesian coordinates. He was a great mathematician, amongst other things. Uh, he, he, his philosophical view is called dualism in the sense of two, because he says there are, the, there are two substances that make up the universe. One of them is matter, uh, and that makes up our bodies, as well as, you know, rocks and things. Everything made of atoms is material. But then he says there's this other stuff called mind. Now, mind and matter share no properties in common. Uh, matter has location that you can handily locate using his coordinates. But uh, mind does not. However, what mind has is the ability to think, and matter does not. So... We, human beings, are some kind of combination of the two. We have bodies, that's the material aspect, but we also can think. Now, where are our minds, as the Pixies uh, famously asked? Well, not in our heads, because, as I said, only matter has a location. Mind does not. So uh, Descartes' theory um, produced the mind-body problem. Uh, the contemporary critics of Plato brought this up. I'm sorry, Descartes brought this up. They said, uh, okay, if mind and body share no features in common, how do they interact? Why is it that this mind that has no location has some kind of connection with this body instead of any other body? Because it's not as if it's in the same place as it. It has no place. So how is it that we tell minds apart because they don't have location or extension or anything? What makes one mind different from another? That's one problem. But also, why is it that each mind is associated with a different body. However, the, when uh, Stitch and Donaldson talk about Cartesian minds and um, 
uh, Parfit talks about Cartesian egos. That's what they're talking about, immaterial things that um, think. Okay, so uh, the soul theory says we are not our bodies, we are these souls. And of course, the great thing about that idea is, well, we know horrible things happen to these bodies after a certain time. They rot, they, they die, and then they rot or are cremated. And if we are our bodies, as the body theory says, then that's the end of us. We're gone, we don't exist anymore. Now, possibly we could be um, resurrected, but there are problems with that that Eric Olson um, points out and then lots of people point out. Uh, even if, you know, if uh, you make a new version of me that looks like me, it's not me. It's like uh, I could somebody suppose somebody set fire to the Mona Lisa and I said, don't worry, I can produce a perfect version of it. And I produce an atom for atom copy. It's not the Mona Lisa. And if you produced an atom for atom thing that said, hey, it's me, um, it wouldn't be me, we would normally say. So the body theory has problems for the idea that we might exist after our, our death. Whereas the soul theory uh, has the great advantage that if our bodies are destroyed, our souls can live on. And in, indeed, that's what Plato argues for in the Phaedo. He says the, uh, the soul is immortal. So we can just get a new body, um, as, for example, Hindus and Buddhists believe. Uh, Hindu, better stick with Hindus because the Buddhist view is complicated. Uh, but the Hindus certainly believe that you have a soul that is reincarnated. It can go into different bodies, um, you know, sometimes animal bodies if you did bad things in your current life. Uh, so that's nice. Now, what's the problem with this? Um, well, what uh, Stitch and Donaldson point out is that, first of all, there's no evidence that there is a soul. Because, of course, the only thing that we can ever get evidence for is material or something part that physics can, can measure. Which, even if you don't count energy, say matter or energy. Uh, and the soul is supposed to be neither of those things and doesn't have a location. Um, so we can provide no evidence for it. Uh, that's one problem. And also, um, we, we can provide evidence that seems to count against it. If you take, uh, we can provide evidence that in fact it's not us, uh, the mind that does the thinking, it's our brain. If you put my brain in a blender, I will stop thinking. Or I, I often wonder what people who believe in soul think is happening in Alzheimer's cases, like for example in those in the two in two of the movies in our um, in our film selection, Away from Her, and Still Alice. Uh, what's going on there if you believe in the soul? Is the soul getting damaged? No, they don't tend to think that. Well, then why is it that the person can no longer think in the same way? Is the connection between their mind and their body being severed? So their body is becoming less, less able to talk, but somehow there's a perfectly lucid version of them that is like trapped and unable to communicate anymore? doesn't make sense to me. Um, and the, the other problem that Stitch and uh, Donaldson point out is if the soul theory were true, then you could never know if your mother was your mother because you can't see into her soul. You can't see that she has the same soul. And furthermore, uh, and here's another point that uh, Locke makes. Locke says, um, <clears throat> He, first of all, he doesn't think having the same soul is necessary. He says, imagine your soul was composed of material that shed chunks of itself, just as your body. Your body sheds, shed cells. Um, uh, maybe your soul replenishes itself so that after every seven years, you've got an entirely new soul. Does that mean you cease to exist every seven years? No, you could have a new soul and still be the same person. So therefore, your soul is not necessary. Having the same soul is not necessary. And he also gives an example of uh, a Christian Platonist, which means a Christian who believed in souls, because at the time Locke was writing, that wasn't the universal view. Um, 
he he says a a Christian play he met a Christian Platonist who claimed to have the soul of Socrates. You know, like Shirley MacLaine claims to have the soul of. It's always important people in the past that people claim to have the souls of. They they never claim to have the soul of a toilet cleaner from the past. It's always like uh, Cleopatra or Socrates or something. Um, anyway, he met somebody who claimed to have Socrates' soul. Was that person Socrates? Well, what do we we say? Uh, it, Lock it, asked him, do you remember being Socrates? Do you have any memories of being Socrates? And he said, no, I just have his soul. And that seems to, uh, what Locke says, and I think most people agree, is that that shows that having the same soul is not sufficient because this person has Socrates' soul, but without remembering anything about Socrates, you it isn't Socrates. So imagine this, imagine that you are told when you die, your soul will continue to exist and in fact will go to heaven. But it will be wiped clean of all memories. Just, you know, not even a trace that can be recovered. It's not like your, you know, your homework on your hard drive that can be recovered or, you know, the porn that you try to delete. That can always be recovered by some uh, tech whiz. These memories are gone. White, gone, 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 there, as if they were never there. So there's a soul up in heaven that, as far as it knows, was born in heaven, has no memories of you. Well, it's your soul. Does that mean you have survived? And I think most people agree, no, you haven't survived. And in fact, that leads on to Locke's view, which is that it's the memories that count, not the soul they're stored in. So the analogy I always give is that, according to Locke, persons are like... Uh, like a digital photograph. So you take a bit digital photograph on your phone, you put it on Instagram. Now it's on Instagram. Maybe your phone gets destroyed, but you, thankfully you put the, uh, the photo up on Instagram so you can download it to a new phone. Um, think of your old phone as like the soul. It's the thing that produces the photo in the first place, uh, but it can be destroyed and you can survive. So long as the memories survive, that's what's important, not the thing that contains the memories, uh, which is what your soul is, or if you don't believe in souls, your brain. Okay, um, so what Locke suggests is that it's the memories that count. So, uh, a simple Lockean view is like um, the first memory theory on page 224 of the Stitch and Donaldson um, article. So, page 224. Oh, here's our buddy Locke. What a schnoz on that man. Um, so, the first theory, memory theory one on page 224. A person stage. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, here's another piece of philosophical jargon. Uh, this is a person stage. Why? Because it only exists a short amount of time. Let's say the person stage, you're looking at a person stage in the course of this video. It begins at the beginning of this video and ends at the end of this video. It's a stage of me, but my entire life consists of a set of these stages. So then the question is, is the stage that is in this video part of the same person as, say, a, a baby in a photo. I should have brought a um, picture of me as a kid. I was, I was an ugly baby. My, um, my parents tell me this and produce photographic evidence. I was a happy baby, but I was but ugly. Thankfully, I blossomed. Anyway, memory theory once. There's a person stage at an earlier time, like the baby stage, and a person stage at a later time, this, uh, are parts of the same person's life, the whole link of all of them, if and only if the later person stage can remember an experience that the earlier stage had. Now, uh, that's the idea. So, in other words, I am the same person as me aged, as the age I was in my first passport photo, which is a black and white photo, which gives you some idea. Um, and I've got my national health glasses that look like this. 
and hair down to here and a color up like this because I didn't check before I took the photo in the photo booth that I remember being that kid maybe not taking the photo but I certainly remember around that time I have memories of around that time so that's why that kid is me and none of the other kids in the school photo taken at the same time is me because I have no memory of being them but I have a memory of being that kid so that kid is me that's the link that makes that kid the same person as me that's the simple memory theory all right immediately Locke proposes this some critics uh, criticize it and the most famous critics were Bishop Butler 1692 to 1752 and Thomas Reed 1710 to 1796 okay they give two uh, criticisms the first one is Bishop Butler's and this appears to show that having a memory of something is not sufficient to make uh, the person to make the person that that memory is of me. Now the example that uh, Stitch and Donaldson give of this is uh, Stitch believed that he was involved in a food fight at camp because he'd sort of acquired this belief through a retelling of the story and it was only in his 50s that he recounted the story to his cousin and his cousin said what are you talking about that was me I remember and it wasn't you it was me so somehow Stitch had acquired this memory so he believed I remember starting the food fight when in fact he hadn't all right so this is a problem for the first memory theory because according to the first memory theory Stitch did start the food fight why because the theory says having the memory is sufficient to make that kid you so he had a memory of uh, starting the food fight so therefore he did and what we would say is no that's not true because you can have false memories and in fact uh, you can have false memories implanted and psychologists do all kinds of uh, alarming experiments to demonstrate how really crappy our memories are we can uh, they can implant false memories there's uh, an example very quickly here's an experiment that uh, psychology students they were given the project of implant false memories in people and what they did was this two two young women went uh, this was back in probably in the 70s when they were tape recorders were big and clunky and expensive um, so uh, they um, they were on a train platform they put a bag on uh, a bench on the train platform and wandered off to look at a schedule another graduate student in a big coat came along uh, looked around furtively uh, pre uh, reached into the bag and then did this as if he was taking something else and shoving it under his coat and then walked off briskly then the, the, the women came back and said oh no what happened to our tape recorder our tape recorder has been stolen and then they uh, they said did anybody see who did it and all of these people claim uh, came forward and said yeah uh, and they said okay can I take your number because the insurance company will be calling you and they said yeah okay so the insurance company called back in a couple of weeks and asked them to ex describe the tape recorder and they all did and they claimed and they seemed perfectly sincere that they remembered the tape recorder but of course they all described totally different things because there was never a tape recorder he didn't take anything from the bag they had just convinced themselves that they remembered seeing it so your memory is very easily manipulable like that and that's a problem for the memory theory because that suggests if you remember a tape recorder there was a tape recorder that or if you remember starting a food fight you did um, but if two people remember it they're both this they can't both be the same person so you get a clash so the problem is telling the difference between real and false memories and of course the problem is a real memory is a memory that happened to you but the memory theory can't set, can't use that to distinguish between real and fake memories because that would be circular because they'd be saying it really happened to me if it uh, the memory is mine if I if it happened to me but they're also saying at the same point that is me if I remember it 
so it's circular uh it's sort of self-confirming if if uh, it's my memory if it's me but it's me if it's my memory so it's automatically me and once again you can't distinguish between real and fake memories so we can try and fix that problem for the memory theorem we get memory theory version 2 this is on page 226 a person stage at an earlier time and a person stage at a later time are part of the same person life if and only if the later person stage has we can't really call it a memory because a memory is sort of built into the definition that it's not really a memory if it didn't happen to me it's fake so we can't even call it a memory we have to say we have to invent some new term so there's something in my head that I think is a memory but is possibly not so we'll call it an s memory an s memory of an experience so I have this image of an experience in my mind just like stitch had an image of has an image of things that really happened to him but he also has an image of this, the food fight that didn't and both of them are s memories because they're just images in his head so uh you are that person if one you have an image of it of that image but we've got to add this extra condition and the s memory is caused by the actual experience so that's how we're going to try and distinguish between fake and real memories. It's a real memory if uh, it was the memory was actually caused by the experience rather than... Because there are other ways it could be caused. It could have been implanted in my brain by these uh, scheming graduate students. Or a, you know, or like in, uh, in the movie, the, the... Oh, what's the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, get your ass to Mars. That's where fake memories are... are implanted in his head um they remade it recently with colin farrell oh it'll come to me anyway i, I didn't want to uh, a lot of intro textbooks talk about that movie but it's too trashy i'm afraid to include in our list of movies so he actually has fake memories implanted and that also happens in blade runner which we used in the um in the film noir section uh, fake memories are implanted in Rachel's head so that she thinks she remembers uh, an incident with a spider eating its babies um, but Deckard is able to tell her that experience which she hasn't told anybody else as well as an also an embarrassing playing doctor's memory she has um, because he knows about it because he knows that they were implanted in there so they're fake those memories were caused by her manufacturer because she's a replicant uh, so they're not real memories the real memories are caused by the actual experience at the time all right so maybe we fixed the memory theory here comes the second problem uh, for Locke's theory by Thomas Reed now Thomas Reed they the way they tell it is using these diagrams Thomas Reed tells the story of a soldier Okay, here we have three person stages. This is a little boy. This is a young soldier who uh, is, uh, as a private, is famously brave on the battlefield. And here we have the old general. Okay, uh, the young soldier remembers an incident being a boy and stealing apples from an orchard. So, by the memory theory, the uh the young soldier is the boy because he remembers it and it was really caused by the experience so these are one and the same person all right the old general remembers being the young soldier uh, he remembers uh, bravely capturing a flag on the battlefield which is what the young uh, soldier did so these are one and the same person well by the principle of identity the equal sign if a equals b and b equals c it's a feature of identity that A must equal C. But the problem is the young, the old general does not remember being the boy. So according to Locke's theory, the general is not the boy. But also according to Locke's theory, uh, the young soldier is the boy and the general is the, is the young soldier. So that would seem to show that they, the, the general has to be the boy but if he doesn't remember it it can't be so there's a paradox there it it seems like Locke's theory of memory doesn't capture the um, 
transitive properties of identity. Transitivity is when if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Locke's theory is not transitive because if C does not remember being A, then they're not the same. Now, can we fix this? Yes, we can. Uh, we can fix it with memory theory version 3, which is on page 228. And uh, memory theory says this, a person stage at an earlier time and a person... A person stage at an earlier time and a person stage at a later time are stages of the same person segment if and only if the later person stage has an S memory. So actually that would work for this one. So they're part of the same person section segment. These two are part of the same person segment. And these pers the person segment that this is and the person segment that this is overlap because of course they both include this. And uh, for this to be the same person as this, it doesn't require the new version of the theory, version 3, doesn't require that this remembers being this. It just remember, requires that there be an overlapping chain start that includes this and ends up including this. So all that it requires it, for this, for the general to be the same person as the boy, is that the general remembers being someone who remembers being the boy. And that's enough. So that solves Reed's puzzle. Okay, finally though, we get another favorite of memory theorists, which is the, the Star Trek, they keep calling it the teletransporter. I don't remember it being called that in the, uh, in the show. I, I think it was just called the transporter. And of course in the show, if you've seen it, um, famously they go into a room, they stand on a little circle, and, it goes, and then they say energize and it goes wibbly wobbly and they go all blurry and then they appear on the, the surface of the planet. So they beam up and they beam down. Although they never ever say beam me up Scotty. Um, now that fact is more famous than the phrase beam me up Scotty. So I think everybody knows that they never say it in the show. However, um, the real reason for doing that in the show was because they couldn't afford the special effects needed for little shuttle ships. It was much cheaper just to beam up and beam down. Okay, but they invented this new form of transport, which is, the idea is, here's how the transporters work. You go on and uh, it scans you and re records every single fact about every particle, every atom, every an electron that makes you up. And it puts that in a blueprint and it sends that information down to the planet and uh, it's never explained how you're made again on the planet. Uh, a better idea would be if there was a booth on the planet. And so, so let's make a version of this. You go into a booth, like in um, The Fly. Uh, in The Fly, they have two cabinets. You go into one, you go wibbly wobbly, you disappear and you come out of the other, you know, with your DNA combined with The Fly, unfortunately. But let's gloss over that. But the basic idea is uh, it scans you, gets all the information about you, and then destroys the original at the same time that it makes the new one. So the new one that comes out looks like you, talks like you, but doesn't isn't made of any of the same atoms. It's made of completely new material. So now, if you believe that it is you, that's another count against the body theory, because the body theory says you have to be made of the same stuff. It's also probably a count against the soul theory, because you know, the 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 transporter doesn't record soul information it just records physical information and you know that's all it takes so this seems to be uh, the transporter seems to be an argument in favor of the of Locke's memory theory because most people say yeah that's me that comes out of the other end sure I do it you know so the experience that you have is you go into the booth say in Flint you press the button say you know type in I want to go to Maui press the button and then so, suddenly there's this sort of blur effect and then you see oh look I'm in a booth on the beach in Maui great and you walk out and uh, into the surf now people who disagree with the memory theory say hold on a minute here's a problem say so you think you'd use this all right well let me uh, tell you imagine you use this a few times and then you say okay today I'm going to go to uh, I don't know, visit the pyramids. Um, so you get into the booth and you press the button and it's uh, and when you type in your destination it shows a little picture 
on the screen of inside the booth in Egypt in this case. And you press the button and you feel a tingling effect and nothing happens. You're still there, you're still in Flint. How disappointing. But then you look at the screen and you see, oh my God, it's you in the booth in Egypt. And then a warning appears on the screen. It says, uh, disintegration unit temporarily disabled, coming back online in five, four, three. And, and so what you realize is the way that it works is it destroys you and creates a new one. Only this time there was a slight delay. So it made the new one before destroying the original. Now, would you sit there and wait to be destroyed? Because you should, you've been destroyed before. And after all, there you are, you're in Egypt. You can see the person in Egypt has already left and is about to enjoy the pyramids. Hey, that's you, isn't it? What you realize with this version of the uh, transporter example, it, and what most people say is, uh-oh, I never survived it. Because what actually happens it is I don't get transported. What happens is I get killed and then they make a replica of me that thinks it's me but isn't. It's exactly like Rachel in Blade Runner uh, who has these memories of being a little human child but is, has just been made comparatively recently and has been implanted with memories. And so the first time you used the transporter, you died. And there's been fakes walking around ever since. Uh, that's the intuition some people have. Now, Parfit is going to argue against that, as we shall see. Um, now, actually, I, I've gone a step too far, because uh, suppose you survive. Suppose both of them survive. You don't get disintegrated. Now, who's the real one? Um, well, all right, suppose, uh, actually, let's describe a different version. Suppose you go in, uh, the original gets destroyed, but it comes out, for some reason, it comes out in two different places. So one in Egypt, one in uh, Maui. All right, which is the real one? Now, uh, I've just made it look as if neither is, but suppose you, you believed that uh, no, no, the transporter is fine uh, because suppose you really committed to the memory theory and you say, no, if they remember being me, it is me. I don't care if it's made of the same material. Uh, it can be made of totally new stuff. So long as it remembers being me, it is me. Well, but now there's two versions of you. Both of them remember being you. Which is you? It can't be both. Why can't it be both? Because uh, for the same reason that you can't have it be the case that this is the same person as this one and this is the same person as this one, but they're not the same as each other. Um, if A equals B and A equals C, then C equals B. Uh, so this is the original, goes into the booth, and then this is the one in Egypt and this is the one in Maui. Now both of them can't claim to be this guy because they're not the same as each other. And it, and if they were both the same as this guy, then they would be one and the same. But clearly these two are going to go on and lead different lives and make different memories. So they, they're not the same. So they can't both they can't both be this guy. So the answer cannot be both of them. All right, suppose we say yeah, this one. But that's totally arbitrary. A every reason you have for saying that it's this one, you have exactly the same reason for saying it's this one. So you can't just pick. So the answer that... Uh, that memory theorists have come up with is that neither of them is. That if this happens, if you get duplicates that both remember being the original, then neither of them is. And this is called the no branching constraint. This is on page 231. No branching constraint. So if we add that to the memory theory, the, the final version of the memory theory adds provided there are no bran branching. Now, as Parfit correctly points out in some of his other writings, that's stupid. Because if only one of them made it, you'd say, that is me. So if only, if only one of them appears in Maui, uh, then this one is me. And if only one of them appears in Egypt, then this one is me. 
But how can double success suddenly be a failure? If this one makes it, it is me. If this one makes it, it is me. But if both of them make it, neither is me. That's crazy. That just shows that there's something wrong with this idea. Now, what Parfit says is wrong with the idea is that it's not actually identity that matters. Because it's only to preserve the features of identity that you can't say both of them is me. Because they can't both be you because, you know, they're different from each other. Um, okay. Uh, and also, the other example, the rather colourful example that they give in um, Stitch and Donaldson is imagine Ad Adolf Eichmann gets into a booth and sends a clone of himself elsewhere. Then he can say, okay, because there's now two of me, I don't exist anymore. Uh, so therefore I can't be responsible because only the person that that was me uh, is responsible for the crimes of the Nazis. But hey, that person doesn't exist anymore because of the no branching constraint. Uh, that seems crazy. All right. Um, then in uh, Stitch and Donaldson, we have the personal identity in the brain where we imagine the case of you and your brother Pat and what happens is your body is destroyed leaving only your head and Pat's head is destroyed leaving only his body and then your head is put on his body um, or your brain is transplanted your brain oops yeah how grisly. Boy, it's like that scene in Day of the Dead. The, the most gruesome of the Romero movies. Okay, this was a crappy toy, but here's the brain gets removed, pulled out and put in um, a new, maybe put in a new robotic body. That would be good. So you put your brain in a new robot body. Uh, is that possible? According to, if you believe in uh, what we've called animalism, um, that would mean that you are the brainless uh, body that remains. You're not the new version that, uh, that remembers being you but has a new body. Because... Uh, we have to go with the majority of the animal. It's like if if my uh, liver, no, not liver, a kidney. I donated a kidney. Suppose I donated a kidney to someone and it is donated. It goes over to a new person. Do I still exist? Yes, I'm the I'm the thing that is. I'm just down a kidney now. Uh, well, the animalist would have to say the same thing about my brain, or at least my cortex. Suppose you take the memory part of my brain and you transplant that to a new person. Now, th what is left is uh, a brain-dead individual, but it's me, according to the animalism theory, whereas the new person that remembers being me is not me, according to the animalism theory. Why am I bringing this up? Well, suppose all the problems with the memory theory cause you to go, okay, it must be the body theory. We all have to go with, the animal, with what uh, Locke called the animal rather than the person. But... Uh, just as the memory theory has counterintuitive implications, so does the animal theory. Uh, because the animal theory says if you transplanted my cortex and created it to a, a new host body, maybe a mechanical body, that remembers be being me uh, and says, hey, it's me, I remember it. it and, and, and what's more, the memories in this cortex were caused in the right way. They weren't implanted by some... Uh, evil genius. They're, they're not fake memories. They're real memories. They, this brain created those memories. Um, but this this brain in here, I don't because I can't open up uh, I can't open up Bender's head. I can only open up his stomach. But that's where he stores his brain. Uh, this brain um, created these memories. So they really did happen to this brain. So this is me. Not the, uh, the rather disgusting mess of a body down here that fell into pieces that's not me anymore uh, whereas the animalism theory says this is you uh, and that 
person over there that remembers being you is just like the uh, kidney donor. All right, Olson. So we're now moving on to the Olson article. Boy, this is going to be a long one. Uh, Olson is famous for arguing for animalism, but he has a, a clever new kind of argument for animalism. According to Olson, first of all, some terminology. Olson calls um, a version of the memory theory, the most sophisticated version of the memory theory, basically M M memory theory three plus the no branching constraint. He calls that the standard view. And it certainly is popular amongst philosophers, or at least it was until a couple of decades ago when animalism, when new, the new animalists, including Olson, started to appear. Um, now, he says, here's a problem with the memory theory. And more than just the Star Trek transporter problem, it's, uh, it implies that I was never a fetus. Why? Well, because, of course, you can't even establish... A fetus doesn't even make memories. So even the third version of the memory theory that only requires me there being chains going back. I am not the same person as any person that remembers being a fetus because nothing after the fetus has memories of being the fetus because the fetus can't even make memories yet. So, if, so you can't say things like, I was conceived at such and such a time. Because you weren't. You didn't exist then. You, you is the person, and the earliest time that you existed is when you were able to create memories, which is probably after birth. Um, some people claim to remember being born, but they're crazy. Uh, sorry if that's you. You just discovered you're crazy. Um, now, he says the fetus problem is that, therefore, because no person was ever a fetus, no fetus is ever a potential person, because it is impossible for a fetus to become the person. Um, now, does that seem weird? And See, I'm... I have trouble with Olson. And by the way, I interviewed Eric Olson as part of my series of interviewing contemporary philosophers. Uh, a lot of them wrote on personal identity, including David Shoemaker, not Sidney Shoemaker. Uh, but I, I, I interviewed Eric Olson and uh, asked him a lot of questions about this. And you can watch that video if you want. Ho, ho, ho. No, really, it could happen. Um, I'll, I'll post it in Blackboard as well. Okay, and but I don't find Olson's arguments very convincing. They're very clever, but I don't find them convincing. Um, anyway, I don't see p much of a problem with saying that, okay, I was never a fetus. Fine. Now, the body that I have... See, Locke would say, the animal that... Uh, I, I am both an animal and a person. The animal was a fetus, but the person wasn't. Okay? Uh, whereas... What Olson says is, no, you can't have both of them. you got to pick one. What are you? You can't be both. you got to be one. And if you pick the person, then you were never a fetus. Okay, so given that you were never a fetus, but there was a fetus, what happened to it? It didn't turn into you because you were never a fetus. So where'd the fetus go? Uh, there are two possibilities. The termination view says that the fetus be ceased to exist and suddenly replacing the fetus is this thing that is me. Now obviously this would look exactly like it because it would suddenly be me, but sud at certain moment the fetus ceases to exist and the, the, the me exists. See, I, I don't really have a problem with this. I, I say look, you can either say, think of a butterfly, uh, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Is the caterpillar the butterfly? Well, you could say it is. I mean, it's made of the same cells. What, what actually happens to a caterpillar is pretty amazing. It goes into the chrysalis, and then it doesn't just grow wings. It turns into a soup. It literally becomes a sort of cell soup. Uh, so it breaks down into goop, which then reforms into a butterfly. Uh, and once you know that, it seems like a bigger break between the caterpillar and the butterfly. So either you can say, no, the, the caterpillar ceased to exist when it went into the chrysalis, and the, then a butterfly starts to exist at some point. 
and maybe there's an intervening period where it's neither, it's just soup. Uh, or you can say, yeah, they're one and the same, it's just they have this funny period in the, minute, in the middle where they look li like soup. What's the difference? I think Parfit would say, it's just words, it doesn't really matter whether you say one or the other. They're both describing the same things, it's just a difference in words. Whereas Olson wants to assist, no, this is not a difference in words, this is a difference in fact. Okay. So if you say the termination view, the fetus ceases to exist, that's weird because that just doesn't happen with other animals. I mean, if we say a kangaroo, it starts as a fetus, becomes an adult kangaroo. The, the kangaroo fetus never disappears. So watch this weird feature of human fetuses that they disappear and are replaced by persons. That just seems biologically strange. Okay, so the alternative to that is to give to the answer what happened to the fetus is the co-location view. The fetus becomes a human which shares its space with you, a person. Uh, the animal that was a, pe uh, a fetus is not a person because it could survive without psychological continuity. See, uh, what Olsen is relying on is he says, what makes you the kind of thing you are is tied up with your what are called your persistence conditions. So. Uh, you are a person if what it takes for you to survive are the persistent condition persistence conditions of a per, uh, of a person which are the memory theory you know remembering previous stages whereas animals have different persistence conditions they, they that's just to do with sharing the same life so the the thing that a fetus becomes has the persistent conditions of an animal and is therefore not a person but then the person exists as well. So you have this weird co-location of an animal that is not a person and a person, and they're both. this is both of them. But that's weird because then it implies, well, wait a minute, the animal has exactly the same features, uh, has exactly the same atoms as the person. So can't the animal think? If the person can think, it's because of the brain. The animal has that brain too. So it can think. So there are two things thinking the same thoughts. And if you think I'm a person, the animal is thinking that too. And are you sure it, you're not the animal? How can you tell? You can't tell. So that's weird if you have two thinkers. Or what you would say is that, no, only the person can think and the animal can't. Well, why? They've got exactly the same equipment. The, the human has exactly the same big complicated brain as the person does. And besides, he says, uh, you know, your colleagues in the life sciences would find it weird to hear that gorillas have rudimentary thought, but humans have no thought at all. That's strange. So this is how he argues for the biological view, that uh, the only view that makes sense is that we are basically an animal, not a person. Um, now, when does the animal, now, does this mean that uh, he's anti-abortion because he says we ex begin at conception. No, and I asked him about this in the video. He says, uh, and here's where he actually agrees with Parfit, is he says, it's perfectly all right for you to care more. So suppose you transplanted your cortex uh, from this guy into this guy. According to his view, this guy, which now does not have a cortex, is still you. It's perfectly okay for you to stop, to, know, to not care that this survives, but to care that this survives. So he, even though he would say this is you and you don't exist anymore, he says it's perfectly legit for you to care about this, the existence of this one, which after all remembers being you, more than the persistence of this one. So his view doesn't imply that um, euthanasia is wrong. It doesn't imply that abortion is wrong. But it does say you are a fetus Oh, you were a fetus and you will be uh, a vegetable if you get brain if it was brain dead now there's another question about whether when you finally die you are the same as the corpse and I can't remember exactly what he thinks about that I think he thinks you're not the corpse because he thinks that it's the life that makes you what you are um, 
he discusses the hybrid proposal. A hybrid proposal would be some kind of theory that was able to avoid the fetus problem, which is a problem for the memory theory, uh, and also avoid the transplant problem, which is a problem for the um, animal theory. The transplant problem is that they say the thing without the cortex is still you, even though this person over here says, no, this is me over here. Look, I remember being it. I've got the right part of the brain. That seems to be a, a, a case where our intuitions say the body theory is wrong because this is you. Uh, whereas the fetus case seems to go with the body theory and against the memory theory. So he says, isn't there a hybrid proposal that can have the best of both worlds? And basically he says no, uh, and the hybrid proposal would still have the co-location issue. All right, that's a short article and written in plain language, but still rather subtle and difficult. But it's nothing compared with Parfit, which is long and difficult, and we're already at hour 115, so God knows if you're going to watch this. But you probably need help with the Parfit article, so listen up. First section, Parfit talks about reductionism. Now, the idea of reductionism is uh, both the brain theory and the psychological continuity theory or memory theory um, are reductionist because what they say is the issue of whether or not some put something in the future is me is settled by facts about either brain or body. Both of them are, are facts about things other than identity. So in other words, we can answer the question, is that me in the future, by talking about facts of brain or psychology. An alternative to this would be to say, you could know everything about the brain and psychology and still not know if that's you. That would be anti-reductionist. That would mean that there's some extra fact beyond all the facts about brain and psychology that settles the issue of whether or not that's me. Parfit, in being a reductionist, says, there is no extra fact. Once you know all the facts, you know all there is to know about personal identity, or facts about body and or psychology. And actually, so the psychological theory and the body theory both agree with that. The only theory that might disagree with that would be a Cartesian ego theory, which says there's some fact about whether or not it's the same soul that is not settled by all the facts we can know through physics. Uh, and he says, let's just reject that. All right. So, Reduction, reductionism says uh, we can settle the issue of whether this person's stage is uh, part of the same person as this person's stage uh, by looking at the facts of uh, body or psycho and or psychology, depending on our theory. That's reductionism. Now, there are different kinds of reductionism. There's what he calls identifying reductionism, which just says that uh, if it's the same body, then it's me. And he says that he thinks that's too simple. Then there's what he calls constitutive uh, reductionism. He says, so there's nothing more to a person than the body and psychology, but they're not the same thing. Now, that sounds like a contradiction, but he gives an analogy. There's nothing more to the statue than the bronze it's made up of, but you can destroy the statue without destroying the bronze. Remember, bronze has the uh, persistence conditions of being made of the same stuff, whereas statue has extra or different persistence conditions, like it has to be in the right shape. So if I take a statue, say I take a statue of Bender, uh, it's a statue and it's made of bronze, let's say. If I melt this down, I've still got exactly the same material that I had before, but Bender has gone. The statue is gone, but the material is the same. So that means that the statue, even though there was nothing more to the statue than the bronze, um, it's constituted by the bronze, hence the title. It's not the same as the bronze. So the bronze can survive without the statue surviving. So uh, you can be made of the same thing, but nonetheless not be the same person. Uh, as some people would say happens, in say the um, well uh, if you wiped all my memories suppose you wiped all my memories clean I would have the same body I would be made of the same stuff but I wouldn't be Simon Simon would be gone let's say 
so the other analogy is he says nations, there's nothing more to nations than the people and the territory, but they're not the same. You could have the nation go away and have the same people and territory as if it was conquered or something like that. Um, eliminative reductionism says the statue doesn't exist, the nation doesn't exist, the person just doesn't exist. All that exists is the stuff that it's made up. So talking about nations is talking about fake stuff. What you should talk about is people and land. But there are no such things as, as um, nations. Uh, and then you shouldn't talk about persons. You should talk about memories and bodies. There are no persons. Uh, now, he associates that with Buddhism. Buddhism says you should get rid of this idea of the self. The self, banish it. It's an illusion. You can talk about bodies, they're not an illusion, they're real. You can talk about memories, they're real. But talk of the self is an illusion. You should get rid of it, eliminate it. Um, now, he's going to side with constitu constitutive reductionism for now. Okay. Um, now, reductionism says that there is no such thing as a bare truth. A bare truth is something that is true just because it is true, not because of anything else. Now, what he's already said reductionism says is truth about personal identity is depends on facts about bodies and memories. So there is no bare truth. Bare truth would be truth irrespective of, of those other things. So when he talks about bare truth or barely true, he doesn't mean only just true. He means true in the bare sense. And by bare, he means relying on no other facts. He says there's no such thing about bare, as bare truth about um, personal identity. So get rid of that. So what he means is, um, to illustrate this, he uh, in his book, uh, Reasons and Persons, which is a monumental tome and one of the most important works of philosophy in the past 50 years, uh, he describes uh, various spectrum cases. The biological spectrum, he says, imagine on one end of the spectrum, there's me. On, a, on the other end of the spectrum, there's Greta Garber, or there's somebody who looks just like Greta Garber. In the biological spectrum, the memories stay the same. So, you know, any memories that this has, this has. Th those don't change. But the biology is different. But in other words, on this end of the spectrum, you've got all of the cells that make you up. On this end of the spectrum, there's, there's a being that has none of the cells. So actually, a better example would be, this is you, and this is you if you went through a teleporter. You're not made of any of the same atoms. Now, suppose you believe that you have to be, suppose you believe the body criterion, you say you have to be made of a, a certain percentage. Well, so you think that this is you, and you think that this definitely isn't you. Well, imagine a spectrum whereby next along the spectrum, no, that's next along the spectrum, so this is you. Next along the spectrum is someone just like you, except has one cell different, and then two cells different, and three cells different, until finally all the cells different. If you believe that there's some kind of magic fact about personal identity, you think that there's a cutoff point somewhere, where this side of the line, it's you, the other side of the line, it's not you, and the only difference is one cell. Because identity, whether or not someone is you, is an all or nothing thing. Either they are you or they aren't you. You can't say that's sort of me, that's part me and part not. That's not how identity works. Either it's the same as you or it's not the same. So if that's the case, then somebody with one cell difference on one side of the line and on the other side of the line, this one is, is you and this one isn't you. And the only difference is one cell. And he says, that's stupid. One cell can't be that important. So the spectrum example is meant to show that uh, identity, the idea that identity is this extra fact, first of all, is stupid uh, and also doesn't hold up. Now, Parfit's real view is, as the uh, t title of the, the article says, identity doesn't matter. And what he believes is that if somebody, what does matter is psychological connectedness. So in other words, if somebody remembers being you, then that's important, then, then that's worth caring about. But 
if exactly if if we have the branching case where two people remember being you puppet says great double success i have no problem with that now are both of them you he says no i don't care what you say you can say they are me you can say they aren't me that's the language of identity that has to be 100 percent on or 100 percent off and i don't care about identity i just care that something exists that remembers me do i survive that's a verbal matter that's a matter that is only settled by words and i don't care i don't care if you say i do survive i don't care if i don't survive i just care about whether or not that being remembers me that's the fact that matters not some extra thing on top of it that says but is it me all i care is does it remember being me so his theory of he has a theory of survival which is a lot like identity except that it can happen by degrees and he believes that for example I should care less about the version of me in the future because it remembers less about me now so should I care a lot should I care just the same about me aged 80 as I care about me tomorrow no he says because the me age 80 has much less connection with me now so I should care proportionally less about it whereas if you believe in identity me age 80 is me me a day from now me just the same so I should care the same amount as me tomorrow as I do age 80 and he said no that doesn't make sense it's a matter of degrees and I because identity is not a matter of degrees then who cares about identity so that's uh, his essential view if it's not clear from this article all right so he says we should reject section two on importance he says we should reject the idea that personal identity is what matters in survival so survival i survive i can survive by degrees if something exists that remembers me a little i have survived to a lesser degree than if something that exists re that remembers all of my memories but you know survival a little is better than nothing it's just to uh, surviving so that it remembers and uh here uh, he talks about the brain-based psychological criteria so if you are convinced that it has to be your brain that's remembering uh in other words you think that using a transporter is death because it's no it's not your brain it's just a copy of your brain then uh then you don't survive even though there's something that has your memories because they're not memories that are caused in the right way they have to be caused by having the experience not by being cloned from something that had the experience and sent across space all right so page 430 he talks about an argument he says personal identity just consists in other facts that's reductionism we've talked about that that you know whether or not it's me is just uh, a question that is settled by facts about body and or psychology there's no extra fact um, if this is true if reductionism is true then reductionism about importance should follow which is that if reductionism is true then it's only the other facts that have importance not the question of whether or not it's me because the question of whether or not it's me depends entirely on facts about memory or biology so it's those facts that matter not whether or not it's me so therefore conclusion personal identity cannot be rationally or moral importance I shouldn't really care whether or not it's me that survives uh, teletransportation or transport of my cortex. I should just care about what's important, which is if that being remembers being me or, you know, whatever we decide is important, which for him is the brain based psychological criterion. Uh, so if it's a, the cortex that made those memories and it remembers being me, then it doesn't matter that it's not the same animal. So he's opposed to Olson's view. Now, Mark Johnston, who's a bit of an animalist, uh, calls this argument on page 430 the argument from below. So the argument from below is Parfit's argument. This answers one of the questions on the quiz, which you deserve a freebie if you've lasted to an hour 28. Uh, whereas um, Mark Johnston's own argument is the argument from above. So Parfit gives the argument from below, Johnston gives the argument from above. The argument from above says, so Johnson says, Parfit is saying, what matters is the, the facts below, the facts in the nitty gritty about biology and, and psychology, not the facts about identity. And the facts about identity only have importance 
derivatively from the facts about identity. So if this is important, it's only because this was important first. Whereas Johnson says, well, what if I turn that on its head? And I said, these are only important because of this. We only care about um, biology and identity because because they, they're they connected with identity and identity is the thing that matters first. Now, so what do you say to that, Parfit? And Parfit says, eh, look at the, uh, let's use an analogy to see if that's right. Uh, look at the question of someone in a persistent vegetative state, like Terry Schiavo or something like this. They're alive. Does that mean that their life alone has significance? Uh, and he says, well, let's look at uh, the facts down below. They're breathing, but they have no psychology. The fact they have no psychology means that the breathing is unimportant, he says. So their life has, has no importance because of these facts. Whereas uh, if you took the Johnson view, you would say life is important. So therefore, the fact that they're breathing has importance. And uh, Perfect says that's getting things backwards. So he just says, I, I'm not buying it, Johnson. So Johnston tries a second approach. He says, OK, if we buy this idea about reductionism of importance, which is if uh, fact, higher level facts just depend on lower level facts, then it's only the lower level facts that have importance. Then he says, well, if you believe if you believe in physicalism, which is that the universe is just made of a physical stuff, there are no ghosts or whatever. And most philosophers do believe that. And you believe this reductionism about importance. Well, is it important that particular atoms are located in particular ways? No. But it just so happens that particular atoms being located in particular ways makes us makes life exist. But if you say uh, the importance of this depends on the importance of this, well, we've said that this isn't important and, and these things depend on this, so therefore life isn't important. So... Uh, physicalism, the idea that everything is made of atoms, and the idea that uh, of reductionism about importance equals nihilism. Nothing matters. Life doesn't matter. Human life doesn't matter. Why? Because it's just atoms and they don't matter in the abstract. Um, and Johnson says, well, I believe that life does matter. So therefore, that shows this is what's called a reductio ad absurdum of the idea of reductionism about importance. Um, Parfit's response to this is that, uh, well, he says things like chemistry, even if physicalism is true, uh, we need chemistry. There can be chemical facts and there can be biological facts, even if they're just composed of atoms. I'm not sure if he replies to Johnson's argument that well. All right. Finally, we're testing the idea that personal identity doesn't matter. And we have another version of the brain transplant version. Instead of Pat, as it is in uh, in the end of the Stitch and Donaldson, it's uh, him and his brother. He's paralyzed. His brother is dying of brain cancer. or No, yeah, brain cancer or something. Something is destroying his brain. Um, so should we transplant his, his brain into his brother's body? Because his brother's body is fine, uh, whereas... Parfit's body is paralyzed, uh, but as Parfit's brain is fine, whereas the brother's brain is getting destroyed. So put his brain into the body. If you, this is the transplant problem for physicalism. Should I accept, accept this procedure? Uh, now, an animalist, this puts an animalist on the spot because a true animalist would have to say, well, I cease to exist then, so therefore I shouldn't. But even an animalist is going to say, I do it. And in fact, he's right. Olson would say, I do it. Olson would say two things. He would say, I no longer exist because I was or I was the animal. I'm the paralyzed body without a brain left behind. And that's going to die soon. Whereas the thing that has my memories and is in the brother's body, that's not me anymore. That's not me, even though it has my memories. So Olson agrees with that, but Olson would still have the procedure because he says it's OK to care more about this new thing that thinks it's me than the real me that ceases to exist. It's OK to care more about that. So he would actually agree with Parfit there. Now, what Parf but pa the lesson Parfit takes from this 
is that identity doesn't matter. So who cares about identity? What we care about is this thing that something exists that remembers being me. So the question of whether or not this is me is not important. Identity doesn't matter. What's important is it remembers me. me. Uh, his second idea is supposed to be a challenge for the brain-based psychological criterion. Uh, and here he imagines two cases, case one and case two. In both cases, we end up with the same thing. A hundred neurons have been replaced with a hundred new ones, uh, preserving the memories, but um, uh, it's just that the neurons were dying. So, you know, your brain dies eventually. Suppose you want to be immortal and they have these artificial neurons. They can replace one neuron at a time. You don't lose any memories. You're just replenishing your brain with artificial neurons. Now, if you're the brain-based uh, psychological criterion, replacing one at a time, none of them makes it a new brain, so that's okay. But replacing a hundred is enough to suddenly make it a new brain. So if I take out a hundred and replace them with it, uh-oh, uh it's not the same brain, so it's not me. But if I replace a hundred one by one, then it is me. It's like the old ship of Theseus. If I replace it plank by plank, it's always the same ship. Whereas if I take all the planks away and replace them with a new one, it's a new ship. But we both end up at the same place, a, a ship entirely made of new planks. It's just the, pr the process matters according to this. Well, what Parfit is saying, what matters is the end result. One theory of identity says if we do it this way, take them all out at once repl and then replace them. It's not me. If we do it this way, replace one at a time, it is me. But both of them end up with the same re result. So. I should only care about the result because that's the facts. The facts are the same. The end facts are the same and that's what we should care about. So we shouldn't care the process which is what affects whether it is or me or not. So we shouldn't care whether or not it is me. Final case is my division. So uh, uh, body theorists like to use the teletransport case, you know, where I go in and then suddenly there's me, of, there's two of me. That's a problem for the memory theory. Well, Parfit points out there's an exactly analogous problem for the body theory. And that is, uh, there's actually studies that were done. Um, all right, I don't want to make this any longer than I did, but this is kind of cool. Uh, a radical cure for severe epilepsy is to sever the corpus callosum, which is this set of nerve fibers that joins the two hemispheres of your brain. So your brain is like two hemispheres and then there's this like a cable that connects them and that's the corpus callosum. Now epilepsy is like electrical discharge going crazy in your brain. There are some people who just have non-stop seizures and they can't function. What they discovered is that if you sever the corpus callosum this stops that. But what they also discovered is there appear to be two seats of consciousness. Now, this is very controversial, but they've done studies which appear to show that this hemisphere thinks different things from this. So it's as if you have two people in your head. Now, what they've also discovered is that you can lose an entire hemisphere and still remember and carry on. In fact, there, there was another case where they discovered they did a scan of this girl's head and they discovered that the entire center of her brain was missing and she just had like the the outer layer of her brain and was apparently normal despite missing this huge chunk of her brain anyway so you can lose half your brain and you survive i could lose the right hemisphere and survive i could use to lose the left hemisphere and survive so suppose um Suppose all that survives of me, my body is crushed and one hemisphere is destroyed. All that survives of me is one hemisphere. I transplant that into a new body, maybe my, my twins whose brain was entirely destroyed. Have I survived? If you believe the brain-based criterion, you say yes. Okay, well what if both hemispheres survive and they're put into two different bodies and both of them have all of my memories? Now there's two of me and it's exactly analogous to the case where I divide in the transporter case. So he calls this case my division. Now according to the body cr brain criterion you would have to say that neither is me so again double success is a failure. If one half survives then I've survived. If this half survives I've survived. But if both of them survive I've ceased to exist. 
And what he says is that's stupid. We should stop caring about identity because it's only the transitive properties of identity that force us to say that double success is a failure. According to me, double success is a double success. I should be doubly happy about both hemispheres surviving because identity is not what matters. Now, Parfit is a radical and actually says that he has discovered that his view is basically Buddhist. Uh, he's arrived at it through complicated analytic philosophy, but it's essentially Buddhism. And he says, um, if you just look at the facts of the matter and stop worrying about, will I be here tomorrow? You stop caring about the I, as Buddhism tells you you shouldn't. It's very comforting. He says, even the use of the word I can lead us astray. Consider the fact that in a few years I shall be dead. He was right. He died a few years after this. This fact can seem depressing. But the reality is only this. After a certain time, none of the thoughts and experiences that occur will be directly causally related to this brain. Just focusing on the lower level facts uh, or be connected in certain ways to these present experience. That is all this fact involves. And in that redescription, my death seems to disappear. Now what Johnston would say is, hey, exactly what I said would happen has happened. Nihilism. Value vanishes according to your argument. That's what's happening. Uh, and that's a bad thing because your death is important. All right, you decide. Again, if you made it to the end of this video, you deserve a prize. I should start offering a prize and see who claims it. But not today.